Yep, that's working. Great, thank you. All right, so thank you very much for that very generous introduction, Chris. Um, so my name is Beck McIntosh. I'm one of the genetic counsellors who works at Sydney Children's Hospital. And um, I have had the pleasure of working with Chris for many years now. Thank you. And so I'm going to give you a bit of a crash course in genetics and genetic counselling and what you need to know about genetic testing in 2023. Um, if you've never met anybody like me as a genetic counsellor, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what genetic counsellors are as well. Um, oh. Okay, um, so I, when I go to presentations, I always like to know a little bit about what's coming. So here's my little overview. So I'm gonna try and explain for people who don't know what a genetic counselor is or what a clinical geneticist is really, why you might wanna see someone from clinical genetics. What is genetic counseling? The basics about genetics. If And for those of you who aren't molecular geneticists or work in clinical genetics, um, a throwback to maybe year nine and 10 biology. And then um, genetic inheritance, um, then the meat of the talk is about genetic testing and maybe a little useful kind of idiom to take home. Uh, there's no quiz at the end of this, I promise. And then where we're located if you ever want to see somebody like me. Okay, so why would you come and see somebody like me or why did you get referred or why you should consider a referral if you've never seen a genetics, someone from genetics? So why do people get referred to a genetic counsellor? I guess I'm telling you all of this to give you some context about um, things later in the talk. So maybe you have a suspected genetic cause for your medical problems, in this case like epilepsy, and your doctor wants to order a genetic test and you want to talk through the issues about the test. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you might understand why your doctor didn't just order the test on you and you want to talk through the issues beforehand. Uh, Maybe you and or your child have a confirmed genetic cause for your medical issues. So someone's already ordered a test. Now we know why you are the way you are and you wanna talk through the genetic results and you wanna understand what this means for you and your family. Um, maybe you have a suspected or confirmed genetic condition and you're planning a family and you wanna understand what your options are for family planning. I will be upfront and say, I'm not gonna cover family planning options today. That's kind of a talk in itself. Um, and uh, or alternatively, a member of your family has a genetic condition and you want to consider genetic testing to determine if you yourself are at risk of that same condition. So we've sort of covered these, like, but I'm going to cover them in a slightly more detail. So maybe you want to come and talk about genetic testing and organised consent. So I guess, you know, do you or your child want this test? Like, why would you come to genetic counselling? I guess to have a more comprehensive discussion about do you really want this test is this the is this the right time for you um do you understand what you're getting yourself into maybe you want to wait until the technology gets better is the likelihood of us finding the answer now any good or should we wait what about the other implications of testing i'm not really going to cover insurance today um other than to say health insurance in australia is never affected by genetic results unlike in other countries like the us um, but there, there are different types of insurance that may be affected by genetic testing. Um, but what about how long the test might take? Do we need to do a different type of test that might be quicker? Or do we need to ask the laboratory to expedite a test? What about if we find something that's uncertain? And again, I'm going to come to that later. And what does this result mean for me and my family? A genetic counsellor can talk you through the results of the genetic testing. Well, I need help understanding the result. The doctor only talks to me in medical jargon. I don't know how to explain the result to my child because I don't, they don't really understand the implication of the result. I can't explain it to them or to the members of my wider family. I don't know how to tell them I need help. What about if I want to have a baby? What are the implications about what tests can I have to plan to plan my family? Um, or I did a test a couple of years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago that we, where we never found the answer. Can we do more testing now to find the answer? And the answer to that last one is probably yes. This is a very content heavy talk. And so um, I have put a lot of really nerdy genetics cartoons kind of scattered through the talk just to break it up for you. Um, and because, but also I am, you know, I work in genetics, I'm generally a nerd. And so these are very nerdy cartoons. Okay. So what is genetic counseling? When people refer you for genetic counseling, it sounds like the previous slide where you're gonna lie on a bed and get counseled. And what is a genetic counselor? So the national definition, which is very wordy, is a communication process which aims to help individuals, couples, and families understand and adapt to the medical, 
psychological, familial, and reproductive implications of the genetic, genetic contribution to specific health conditions. That's a very wordy way to say that, I guess the goal of my job is to help you understand you as a person and what the genetic result means for you and your family. So what's so special about a genetic counselor? Well, I have specific training in this job. Like I went to university to do this, like I have a genetic counselor. Getting in progress. Just getting an echo, Chris, if that helps. Um, and uh, I guess there are a lot of consequences potentially about initiating genetic testing. Separate to um, initiating a normal standard blood test or an X-ray or a medical test of any kind, we're not just testing potentially you or your children um, because your genetic, your genetic DNA is inherited from your parents and passed down to your children. So we're potentially not just testing you, but other people in the family by default. So um, I guess there are consequences of initiating genetic testing. So we are specifically trained to think, to have a think about not just you as an individual, but you in the context of your wider family. We also give you specific time to talk about the genetic result, This is our job. And, you know, that's not the neurologist's job to sit down and talk to, your, to you about your result. Um, they have other jobs to do, or your GP, they have other things to be doing with, um, with their medical time with you. But this is solely our job. We have dedicated time to talk to you about your result. We can specifically talk to you about the impact of a genetic result for you and your family. This is what we do all day in and out. And so, I guess, you know, we are, the impact of a genetic result is unique, um, different to a lot of other things that can happen in your life. And it's not all bad news, but a lot of it is giving bad news and, you know, we're very used to <coughs> When you come and see somebody like me um, um, or a clinical geneticist, a lot of the time we're talking about family history. And like I said, we're not necessarily just testing you or your children, but we're, um, I work in pediatrics, so usually we're testing children, um, but we will be asking you about your family history. And that is important. We usually take what we call a three generation pedigree. We start with the individual and we work our way back their three generations. So their parents and their grandparents, and we will advise you if we need additional information. We collect that family history for multiple reasons. Um, firstly, it helps us with the diagnosis. Sometimes there is no family history and uh, sometimes there is lots of family history. The lack of family history is a clue. We're looking for clues. Lots of family history is also a clue. We're also trying to determine who else in the family might be at risk. So there might be nobody else at risk, but there might, might be lots of other people at risk and documenting that on a family tree is also really important. Second, well, thirdly, I guess, we're trying to determine if there's anything else which needs to be discussed. There might be other genetic conditions that are running in the family like cancer or eye disease or heart disease. And those things can be addressed while we're seeing you. And lastly, we can help try and answer questions about anything else you might have been worried about that might be connected. Usually there's one or two of those when we see you. You might think, um, oh, well, this is the reason that this, that I am the way that I am. You know, um, this happened when I when my mum was pregnant or this happened early in life. Could that all be related? And we can try and answer that question for you and either clarify, yes, it is, and uh, yes, it is related, or no, it is not, and answer that question for you. Um, we can also, like I said, help you talk to your family about the diagnosis because sometimes genetic conditions can have implications for the wider family. We write letters um, that we can use to disseminate the information to that wider family. We do that through you, um, or we can help facilitate testing of that wider family. And also, I guess we can help with the discussions of those family members about the results. It means you don't have to become the genetics expert if you don't want to. If you want to be the genetics expert, that's fine, but it means one less thing that you have to do. Okay, so. What are some common questions that get asked of me? So how did this happen? Um, how was this inherited? Can this happen again? And what are the implications for my family members, other children, siblings, parents? And what happens if I wanna have a baby? And like I said, I'm not gonna cover question five today. And um, as far as I'm aware, there's no wizarding gene, but I am a muggle, so I'm not entirely sure. All right. Um, 
I'm going to give a gentle genetics lesson. Uh, there is no quiz. And this is probably the most technical part of the talk and uh, the most probably jargon filled part of the talk. I think someone still has their microphone on if that helps. Um, okay, so uh, this is the basics that you might remember from high school biology. Um, so we're made up of billions and billions of cells. Inside every single cell, we have hair cells, skin cells, eye cells, brain cells. And inside all of our cells, is a complete set of our genetic material. That's our genome. Inside the genome is 3 billion molecules of DNA and it's a complete set in every single cell. Those DNA, that DNA is like a four letter alphabet. And those four letters are packaged up into genes. We've got 20,000 genes. They come in pairs. We get one of every gene from mum and one every, of every gene from dad. Those genes are further packaged into long thread-like structures called chromosomes. I'll show you a picture in a second. And um, in, our, in all of our cells, we have 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs in every single cell, except for the sperm and the egg. The egg has 23, the sperm has 23. They come together and they make a matching set. The first 22 pairs of chromosomes uh, are the autosomes. They're the same between males and females. And the last pair are the sex chromosomes. Uh, females have two Xs and males have an X and a Y. That's probably the most technical part. All right, um, this is a picture because I think I think pictures and analogies help. So here is one cell. And if you zoom into the nucleus, the center of the cell, here's our chromosome. There's 46 chromosomes, one chromosome. You unspool it a sec and then here's a section, which is our gene, unspool that further. And these bars are the DNA, three billion molecules of DNA in the cell. But I think analogies are really helpful for people who like analogies. So back to the cell, the cell is like our library. Every single cell has the library set up the same way. And all of our, every single person has a, their own personal library. The library in all of our cells is set up the same way, but they all look slightly different, which is why we're not clones of each other. But all of our libraries are set up the same way. But if we all walked into our own personal library, they would all look, the contents would essentially be stacked the same way, but the little, the little intricacies of what's in them it would be slightly different. If we walked around, they would be 46 pairs of shells, 23, sorry, 46 shelves, but 23 pairs of shelves. That's our chromosomes. And on the shelves would be 20,000 books. That's our genes. And if we opened up all of the books, there would be a total of 3 billion letters inside the library. Hopefully that analogy makes sense to you. Here is a pictogram of the chromosomes, if you like. They're kind of the thread-like structures. So like I said, the, they're just lined up biggest to smallest, chromosomes one to 22. They're the autosomes, auto meaning same, zone meaning chromosome. And then the last pair is the sex chromosomes. Females have two Xs, males have an X and a Y. And these are just the sex chromosomes zoomed in. Okay, that's the technical part. So how are things are inherited? Is this a, a new thing or a family thing? Because genetic can, things can be new, but genetic are not inherited, or they can be inherited through families. So there are kind of three main forms of genetic inheritance. And I'm sort of cheating by saying three, um, because there are actually more than three, but I'm going to talk about three sort of four. And, um, but to be clear, I'm not going to talk about mitochondrial or sort of brackets maternal inheritance today. That's just a bridge too far, I think, for a like a slightly less than one hour talk. Um, so I'm going to stick to what we call autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, and X-linked dominant and recessive inheritance. All right, and that sort of covers the kind of bulk of the epilepsy group. So autosomal dominant inheritance. So the autosomes being the ones that are the same between males and females. So these are the genes that are on the autosome, so not on the X and the Y chromosome. So autosomal dominant inheritance can either be from inherited from an affected parent. So either mum or dad, doesn't matter. Or it can occur for the first time in an individual. If it occurs for the first time in an individual, the term is de novo, which is like, we love fancy terms in genetics and de novo is Latin for new. So it's just a new, a new occurrence for the first time. 
Um, so this pattern of inheritance affects both males and females. And if you have the condition, once you have the condition, there is a 50% chance of having a child with that condition. There's a 50-50 chance of passing it on. So um, there's a couple of caveats to this particular pattern of inheritance. For some autosomal dominant genes, so for their, there are some genes in the body that it's really, really important to have two functioning copies. And if you have a change in one, then you can be at risk of having the condition. So for some autosomal dominant genes, they can present differently in different families. So for some families, they will have the condition running in every single generation and it will pass down from parent to child. But um, in the kind of milder set um, of, with epilepsy, um, they can have, it can be variable in each generation in terms of the types of seizures and epilepsy that you might see. So some individuals in, who might have it might have tonic-clonic seizures, other people might have absent seizures, or some people have, might have focal seizures. Sometimes, rarely, a person can have the change but not express it at all, but they can still pass it on to their children who may end up with epilepsy. And that is termed non-penetrance. You're getting a real deep dive in genetics here. These, this particular type of autosomal dominant inheritance tend to be tend to cause less severe um, epilepsy. And it's not, it's like it's still significant when you experience, experience it yourself but it's not what we call a developmental epileptic encephalopathy where it's seizures that are very difficult to control and it affects your development. So often um, these, these individuals you know, work, they have, they have epilepsy, which is often significant, but they can have children and move on and, and live long lives. However, there are other types of genes, autosomal dominant genes that present at a very early age, the, the seizures present at a very early age and affect their development. And this is called a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy or a DEE. And, uh, and so these are genes where having one change is sufficient. The other copy is fine, but one change is sufficient. And in this instance, they usually occur as a de novo or new event and other family members are unlikely to be affected. And the condition is so severe that those individuals who are affected are unlikely to go on to have their own children. So here's a pictogram of how this condition can be inherited. Now in this pictogram, um, the father is affected, but as I've mentioned, with autosomal dominant inheritance, it doesn't matter whether the father or the mother might be affected. So here the darker, um, the black sperm is the one that has the change. And if you have the one that has the change, you have the condition. So when you make a baby, you either pass on the one with the change or the one without. So it's a 50-50 chance whether you pass the condition on. So these children will not have the condition and cannot pass the condition on. Whereas these children will have inherited the change and will have the condition. So a different type of inheritance called autosomal recessive inheritance occurs in different types of genes which can tolerate having a change in um, they, it's fine to have a change in one of the copies, but if you don't have any functional copies, so both copies have the change, the, the individual who has that will be affected. Usually this occurs when both parents of that child carry the change. And so they each have one functioning copy and one with a change. And then when they have a baby, the combination of those two changes, um, that means that baby doesn't have any functional copies. So again, this is on the autosomes, the same between males and females, not the X and the Y chromosome. So it affects both males and females. And often there's no family history of the condition. If, you, if both parents are carriers, it is a one in four chance or 25% chance of them having a subsequent baby with the condition. And it is important to remember with autosomal recessive conditions, every single person in the world is a carrier for about 10 to 20 different genetic conditions that we don't know about because or if you're a carrier, you're well and healthy, you've got that backup copy. So in this instance, the gray copy is the one that is non-functioning and the white copy is the one that's fine. And every time you have a baby, these are the four outcomes. And genetics has no memory. So it's not, if you had one baby um, who has the condition, you were still at risk one in four every single pregnancy. Ooh. So um, the next type of pattern of inheritance is X-linked recessive inheritance. 
And X-linked recessive inheritance occurs when there is a change found in the gene on the X chromosome. So this is not the autosomes, this is the X-linked X, X chromosome. So you remember from the talk earlier that um, girls have two Xs and boys have an X and a Y. So X-linked recessive inheritance um, occurs in the genes that um, girls can carry because they've got the backup copy, but um, boys don't have a backup copy. So this type, this pattern of inheritance only affects boys. So uh, females can carry the condition because they have the functioning copy. And this usually, this can occur as the first time in a boy, but often um, the, their mothers are, can be a carrier. And if they are, then they would be potentially, if they wanted to have another baby, there would be a 25% chance of having a son with the condition. However, if you are an affected male with, these, uh, with this condition, you will not have affected children. And I will show you why on the next slide. So if you are a carrier female for this, for X-linked recessive conditions, um, every time you have a baby, you can pass on the one, the X with the change or the X without. So 25% chance you would have an affected do uh, carrier daughter, 25% chance unaffected non-carrier daughter, 25% chance of an affected son, and 25% chance of an unaffected son. But if you are an affected boy, you can only pass on your Y chromosome to your sons and therefore they are unaffected, but all your daughters are carriers. There are, in epilepsy, there are kind of a, there's like a sort of unique, um, rare exception to the X-linked category in that there is a couple of conditions called X-linked dominant disorders. Um, the classic forms being CDK05 and, and MECP2 or Rett syndrome. And that's called X-linked dominant inheritance. So where changes are found on the X chromosome, usually as a new change, and it only affects girls. Um, so it only takes one change on the X chromosome. And despite the fact that there's a backup copy, this is enough to cause a problem, but they usually occur as a new change and they're not inherited. Okay, so the topic today, I'm kind of giving you a lot of background, but the topic today really was about what type of tests there are in 2023. And um, so I'm gonna talk about tests. So when I first started in genetics, we used to do one gene, and that was a long time ago, um, we used to do one gene at a time. So if you think, go back to our initial, uh, our previous analogy about the library, we used to walk into the library, look around the 20,000 books and take one book off the shelf at a time. Now that's a very inefficient uh, and inaccurate way of doing testing. And I will admit when I first started in genetics, a very low hit rate. We did not find the answer in very many people. And it was also very expensive and time consuming. Um, so we don't really do that anymore unless we know what we're looking for. So most people these days who present to um, neurology, to a neurologist or a geneticist will not really be having single gene testing unless we already know what we're looking for. These days, most people are having panel testing or the next test down, which I'll talk about in a second. But essentially panel testing, if you hear that term, is where we walk into the library and we take more than one book off the shelf at a time, somewhere between two and a couple of hundred usually. And they're the, usually the genes of interest. So in this case, we would be doing what we call an epilepsy panel. We would walk in, take all the books associated with epilepsy off the shelf and read them cover to cover looking for a spelling mistake. You will also read about exome testing. So exome testing is, oh, I'm sorry. Um, exome testing is the kind of gold standard, um, best clinically available test we have avail in, in kind of internationally really, that is um, cost-effective and pretty good at finding the answer. Um, so some, there will, most people will have a test somewhere between a panel and an exome. Um, an exome is essentially walking into the library and reading the important sections of the books somewhere between 5,000 and 20,000 books. So we've got 20,000 books in the library. That's the analogy. The exome though is not actually reading the whole book. So when people say, oh, I've had the, like I've read all of the books in the library. It's not quite like that. So the exome is reading the protein coding sections of our genetic material. And that accounts for about 2% of the whole genome. So 2% of the 3 billion molecules of DNA. The thought is, and it's, pretty, it's been you know, relatively accurate that that's where the most likely changes are that will cause a problem in the human genome. And 
that's where we that's where we found most of the hits so far or the things that are easily worked out um we, i guess also we've worked out um in terms of uh how we've assessed all of our genes. When we walk into the, back to the library analogy, when we walk into the library, we've set up where all the genes are in the library, all of our books. We know that in every single person, 20,000 books all have a place. We've mapped them all out. They're all in the same place in everybody. But so far up to 2023, we've only associated about five to 6,000 of those books, those genes back to a human disease. So the exome really is only testing the genes we know about in 2023. So really it's looking at the protein coding sections of those five to 6,000 genes. It's not looking at the whole 20,000. The technology just isn't good enough to do that right now. Um, in terms of what I call, I mean, protein coding, if you think about reading books cover to cover, there is a lot of things in, in the books that when you read a book, you can kind of skim over things like punctuation, joining words, um, potentially the prologue and the epilogue if you're not a bibliophile. Um, so if you think about reading 5,000 to 20,000 books, but only the important words, the protein coding section is probably reading books, important words and missing out, but only the. So that would that would that would be the protein coding section, the exome. Um, and so that's. It, that bit is the exome, 5,000 of the 20,000 and only the important words. The next test up, which everybody wants, um, is, called a whole, is called whole genome sequencing or doing your genome. And essentially that is walking into the library and taking the first book off the shelf, reading from the very first letter of the first book all the way around, um, every single letter on every single page until the very last book in the library. The all three billion molecules of DNA. That sounds like a very straightforward thing. Um, and we do have a technology to do that. Uh, the issue at the moment is the storage required to do that, the cost, it's very high, and our analysis, our ability to interpret it. And so we're pretty good at interpreting exomes. Our ability to interpret the bulk of the genome is not very good. And so that most people are not doing um, genomes at all. And we, we really don't do them because we can't analyze the bulk of it. And so, um, and the cost is quite prohibitive. We're really only doing them on a research basis. There is a Medicare item for quite set criteria for exomes. Okay, so how is the test actually done? It's usually a blood test. Um, there's good reasons for that. Sometimes we do it on other samples like skin or saliva. The lab extracts the DNA. They look for changes. We're looking for a spelling change in the DNA. Um, we then, we have a um, pretty good international reference database of people who are well and healthy, whatever that means. And um, so we can compare to say, well, have we seen this in people who are well and healthy before? Is it normal variation? There are also pretty set international criteria um, which decide whether the change is going to cause a genetic condition or is it just normal, um, normal variation. And by normal variation, I always use myself as the example. I don't know how well it projects on Zoom, but I have red hair. Red hair is genetically encoded, but it's not a health problem. So there will be variation in my DNA that encodes my red hair, but it's not going to cause me a health problem. So that's just that, that will be in the international reference database that that I will have, if I, I haven't had my genetic testing done, but if I did, that I would have a variation that would cause my red hair. Even after we do all testing though, sometimes there is remaining uncertainty because genetic testing is pretty new and we're still learning. So genetic tests have to be, like these clinically like accredited tests have to be ordered by a registered medical practitioner. If you do 23 and me or equivalent, they don't have to be, but this sort of grade genetic test has to be ordered by a medical practitioner, ideally someone who is involved in your care. And that's because the ordering clinician has to provide a reasonable amount of information to the lab regarding your clinical history and about you. And then that the lab needs that to interpret the results. So whoever's ordering the test needs to know about you. Now, this is the bit that I'm gonna give you like a little idiom about. So what might the result show? So the first category is that we might find the answer. Um, we might find a change. Um, it's called a pathogenic or positive change, um, which uh, it, it's a change in a gene which can cause a genetic condition. Now, a 
Positive change is a bit of a misnomer because it might not necessarily be positive news, like good news. It's just, it just means positive, like, yes, we found the answer. So I like to think of that like, yes, we found the answer. So that's option one, yes. Option two is we find a benign change like red hair or no, we didn't find anything negative. Um, not, again, not negative like bad news, just negative we didn't find an answer. So no changes on the test, which can be linked back to why we did the test. Now, when we say we didn't find an answer, that if we were doing something like an exome, for example, and we didn't find the cause for the reason we did the test, well, there might still be a genetic cause because maybe we tested the wrong genes. If we did a panel, for example, or we did an exome, but maybe the technology isn't good enough to find the answer in 2023. So we can't really rule out a genetic condition on some tests because maybe we haven't found it yet. So I like to think of option two as a no for the moment, but not a no forever. And so sometimes we find things that are tricky or uncertain. So um, the technical term is a variant of uncertain significance. You'll so see people write it as a VUS or a VUS or a VU or a VUS, sometimes a VOUS. Um, that, that's a result where we're not quite sure it's the cause, but we can't be say it, we can't say it's nothing either. So we like to sit on the fence. In genetics, we like evidence. And so sometimes we need to, we want to test other people in the family, like to parents, and I'm going to um, kind of go through that in a second. Um, sometimes we need to do, we need to get some friendly neighbours in a research laboratory to model things in a laboratory to see if they can work out whether it's the answer or not. And very occasionally, depending on the type of tests we do, like an exome or a genome, sometimes we're not looking for this, but we find some other health problem like cancer or heart disease that has other health implications. So when we're thinking about genetic test types, uh, genetic test results, we might find an answer, yes. We might find nothing for the moment, but not a no forever. We might find something tricky. So yes, no, maybe. And then the option, depending on the type of test we do, we might find something else. So yes, no, maybe, maybe something else. So I, we've done all this testing. Like, what does it mean if we find an answer? Like, what's the goal here? Um, I guess if we find the answer, well, we, we've, di we've confirmed there's a genetic con like a diagnosis for you. And then we can provide you with information. Now, even when we have a confirmed diagnosis, sometimes there's a wealth of information. Sometimes there's thousands of people who have the same genetic condition. Sometimes there's five. And, but I guess we, in my line of work, you know, we would provide you with a reasonable summary of what's going on. And usually that information evolves over time, the more people who are diagnosed with that same gene. Very occasionally, and it happening more frequently over time, particularly in epilepsy, we can assist with targeted treatment, so changes to your medication, um, and that, but particularly links to support groups if there are specific links to your either your particular diagnosis or the same people who have the same gene as you, and like increasingly the, the potential for clinical trials, which is really exciting. And I guess, you know, one goal for many people is to provide you with closure if you've been waiting for a diagnosis for a long time. And the technical term is called reproductive confidence, but essentially for some people they say, well, I really wanna have another baby. And now I'm, now I'm happy to have another baby because I know that, what the risk would be. And that's, that's the provision of reproductive confidence. So that's, that's what happens if we find an answer for you. What happens if we're on the fence? We've found something uncertain. Well, uncertainty in my job happens about 20% of the times we do a test, one in five. So the laboratory does an assessment on the variant and my team amongst myself we, and myself and the doctor, we also do the same. And so we think about that in a, in a number of different ways. So we think about, well, will the variant alter the, um, the function of the gene or whatever the product of the gene does enough to cause the actual condition that we see in front of us? Have we seen the variant in other people who have the same condition before? Um, have we seen this variant in people who are well and healthy in those large international databases I mentioned? And is this variant inherited from a parent who's affected or unaffected? So we're looking for clues. I like to think of us like detectives. We're sort of looking for enough evidence to get us out of the circumstantial and into enough to convict. Um, one of the considerations about 
how to kind of get a variant of uncertain significance out of a maybe and into definitely yes or definitely no is to test parents if they're available. So I'm just going to, for people who have never experienced this before, but maybe are turning up to a genetic service, often we are asking to test parents. So I'm going to um, run you through two scenarios, one, one which goes um, with well, the same scenario, but different outcomes. And this is an entirely made up scenario. So like Johnny is not real, the gene is not real. So Johnny has a developmental epileptic encephalopathy, which as I've explained before, is a very significant um, epilepsy condition, which affects their development. There's no family history and he's the first child to his parents. Um, the geneticist has organized a genetic test, a gene panel assessing the known genes associated with epilepsy. The result shows he has, has a never before seen variant in the ABC gene. So we know that other variants in this gene have been seen in, a, in this particular um, DEE, but we've never seen this variant before, it's unique. The geneticist explains that they are suspicious that this variant is the answer because we know that this gene does cause the same condition that Johnny has, but we need more evidence. Um, but they, but so we need to test his parents. And when we do that, we show that it's a new change in Johnny and new changes, the, the coincidence of a new change in the gene that seems to fit is, doesn't happen very often. And so that makes us more certain that this, answer, that this particular change in this particular gene is the answer for Johnny. So the parental data was very helpful. Now, alternatively, it could have gone a different way. So absolutely the same scenario, but this time we did find the variant in Johnny's dad. Could have equally been his mum, but this time, but I said it was his dad. But we know because we've already talked about his family history that um, Johnny's dad is fine. There's no family history. He's never had a seizure. Potentially he's lived 30 years of his life and he's been well and healthy. He probably went to university or, you know, got a job or whatever. Um, and because of that, we would say, well, if this gene change is going to cause a really significant epilepsy, he shouldn't have been able to live 30 years of his life so well and healthy. And so we think actually, given that Johnny's dad's lived his whole life, being well and healthy, and the gene change does not cause the same problem in him, and th then we think that must be fine and not the answer in Johnny. So we need to go back to the drawing board and think about a different cause in Johnny. So we can we can ignore the ABC gene change. Hopefully that makes sense. So we've dealt with the positive results. We've dealt with the uncertain results. Well, what happens if we don't find anything? Um, well, genetic testing is actually always evolving. And if there, if you, if your neurologist or your GP or your pediatrician um, can, thinks there's still a genetic condition to be had, there is now kind of good evidence to say that we should be retesting people every eighteen months to two years, because the number of genes that are being described um, and re and uh, associated back to a human disease, a human condition, is um, in, it increases almost every week. So. You know, in my, in the last several weeks, um, I've had a patient who I've known for over a decade and we tested them. We've done very comprehensive uh, genetic testing on them three times. And on the third attempt, we finally found the answer. So over the course of six years. Um, so it is definitely worth continuing to test to try and find the answer because eventually we probably will get there. So who do you get your results from? Um, it can be your neurologist, your friendly cl clinical geneticist, someone like myself, I think unusually, but potentially your GP, usually the person who ordered the test. I would say usually your results will be given to you in person, but occasionally over the phone. Um, or to, and By in person, I mean virtually as well. It doesn't have to be physically in person. Um, uh, I would say usually the results would be documented in writing as well, either via letter or via email. Okay, we're nearly there. So um, how do you get us involved? I think someone like me, you can just ask. We're genetic counselors are pretty much based, and I'm gonna show you a map in a second, um, at most metropolitan hospitals, like, region, like kind of major metropolitan hospitals around the country. Um, we're really happy to help. We're a pretty friendly bunch. Telehealth is now very readily available, particularly since COVID. Um, it's like the one positive I can find. Um, there, we're, Unfortunately, we're a rather limited resource. There are about 400 genetic counsellors in 
Australia, um, I don't know if there's anybody from New Zealand here, there are gender counsellors internationally. Um, but so triage does occur on a clinical urgency and resources available. And there are a few private clinics available as well. This map I made, ooh, I don't know, years ago. So it looks like WA doesn't have any services, but I promise that they do. And they do a lot of telehealth. They were doing telehealth way before COVID. Um, there's someone does go up kind of here and down here. I just didn't put, I couldn't put the pins in the right place because I made this map myself. Same with South Australia. So apologies to the West Coast um, people. Uh, Clearly, Epilepsy Foundation is an amazing resource and you don't need a link for that. So I've just put some other useful links up um, for things that I find really useful. And uh, so just in terms of specific genetic resources, Gene Reviews has lots of summaries of specific genes if you have a diagnosis already. Um, the Here is, an, is a, um, a blog written, I think, sort of for patients and sort of for, um, for other people, for, um, for medical people by an epileptologist whose wife happens to be a genetic counsellor. They're based in the, U in the US, but um, that is an excellent resource. And I will give my colleagues at Sydney Children's Hospital a plug for Penn New South Wales, which is the Pediatric Epilepsy Network New South Wales, which has a patient and a um, clinician page. And that's it from me. Um, I will stop sharing and you can ask any questions. Thanks, Beck. Open the floor to any um, questions. You wanna come off mute? Maybe I can jump in, but um, thanks so much for this. This is really helpful. Um, I, I just wanted to, so my, my son is four and he's just been sent for genetic testing. Um, I was just asked whether I could maybe just a guide of like, say we in the positive result, Mm -hmm. in that example what what might that look like and kind of what can that then lead to I appreciate it's probably very diverse and, and what it could be but but kind of what's an example there we, we might sort of hope is sort of a, a good case to come through on it as well yeah great question so um I mean there are lots and lots of different types of epilepsy genetic conditions yep. so, um I and I, I won't ask you any details online um so I guess uh I would say that at the end of the day I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you all the things I would normally tell my patient when I give them a diagnosis um I would say that whatever the diagnosis is your child's name is still his name um and so you know, I, I think there's still a lot of hope for whatever whatever genetic condition he's got. I think that if I think the the kind of most useful part about the diagnosis, well, there's probably a few useful parts about whatever diagnosis you might get if you get a positive result. Um, some of that will be just connection to other people, and a lot of the time it will be um, it will mean a lot of the medical people will will stop looking for other things that they think might be going on. It will just mean everyone can kind of go, oh, this is what it is. And they don't have to worry about all the other stuff that they thought it might be. Um, so a little bit more tailored management. Um, mm. It might not change anything. Sometimes I, I don't want to kind of uh, like dramatize anything, but I guess sometimes it doesn't change anything overnight, but it might, I mean, and Chris might be able to um, comment on this as well, but it might in the kind of medium to long-term change things for you. So maybe you don't expect overnight changes. I don't know if Chris wants to comment as well. But lastly, it, it will probably help for access to services like NDIS because they love a label. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'll just jump in. Thanks, Bec. Um, So I, I per personally, my son didn't have a um, diagnosis till he was 14 and then um, got a positive. Uh, and we really went through a lot of the processes that Beck talked about. We, we, we were in a research project. They did a gene, didn't work went on a panel um, and as the gene the epilepsy genes expanded we did get a result through that it didn't change anything for him at the time however we had just luckily landed on the right medications because there are different medications that mm -hmm. work for different presentations so it might be that you can tailor um, the medication at the time but I would say in terms of um, how it changes for the family, if you get a, a positive or um, a gene result, it gives you the opportunity to link in with other families who understand um, uh, the experiences that you're going through because they are unique and um, having people who understand the 
the journey, for want of a better word, that your family's on and, and you can talk to and, and troubleshoot some of the presentations with these rare conditions, just having someone to talk to and um, I guess debrief with and say, my son is having this or my daughter's having this, is this common? Um, there's often Facebook groups um, for mm -hmm. these rare conditions as well. So medically, it, as Beck said, it might not change things in the immediate um, in the immediate time frame, but um, in the short and longer term, and also linking into um, research and and helping understand what um, that condition looks like is also um, an opportunity that comes with under uh, knowing um, what the genetic cause is. Does that help, Adam? Yeah, yeah, I think that does. Yeah, so we're sort of. It won't be a, a clear answer, but it kind of can help on the way and, and kind of partnering up and everything. That, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think just, I, I will say um, one of my, I'm, I love to steal idioms from my colleagues. And um, one of my colleagues likes to say that a genetic diagnosis might help you with the climate, you might say, but it won't help you with the day-to-day -day weather. Mm -hmm. So it won't say, it won't help you that like, to, if a genetic diagnosis won't say that on the 25th of December, he'll have a seizure but it might help with a little bit of prognostication about, okay, well, this is sort of the trajectory that you might be heading in. Um, but sometimes like, if there's limited information about whatever gene it might be, it won't even help you with that because there might be five other people described in the world. So um, sometimes we just go, okay, well, let, let you know, ABC person tell us how they're gonna go. And we hope, you know, they're a bit of a blank slate. Um, so, but I, so I think sometimes it's just, we keep going the way we were going before. So I, I think it probably, sometimes it doesn't change a huge amount, Yep. but it might as well. Great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, Beck, um, my name's Jason. If I can sort of jump on that conversation as well. Um, my daughter has Dravet syndrome, which 80% of kids with that have an SCN1A mutation. My daughter falls into the other 20%. And through a number of rounds of um, genetic testing, they found that she had issues with her pigs, a PIGG gene. Um, and you mentioned before that, you know, sometimes there's cases where there's only a small number of people um, that are described by that. She She falls into that. So I think that gene was only discovered in 2016. Um, so I guess any research they've done on that, the kids are still essentially kids. So we, we don't actually know what it means and it hasn't really changed anything for us. But um, my question runs along those lines of, there's not much known now, but what about the future? Because if there is further information found about that and what that may mean for her, is that up to us as parents now to just keep an eye on research or like how how do we know if something else pops up into the future? That's such a great question. And um, one I don't have a really easy answer for. Um, I, you know, I will say, unfortunately, we don't have a great mechanism for kind of reporting back to people every time a new paper pops up. And so it often is the support groups who... I mean, I, I feel it feels like a really hollow thing to say that the parents end up being the experts more so than the specialists. And they come to us and they say, oh, my God, you know so much more than I do about, well, you know, your child. Um, but it actually is true that, you know, you guys come to us and say, oh, I've, now I've read this thing. And I'm like, oh, OK, great. I should go and read that paper. Um, so you, I, I, I absolutely applaud you that you probably will end up being the expert. Um, and not because I, I don't want to be, but I, I have there's 8000 genetic conditions and I just can't honestly keep a track of them all. Um, I, I have heard of Pig G and so I am familiar, um, but only when they come across my desk, right? So um, I, I think it is really tough. I think if you're in a support group with your kind of small group of people, I think that really helps. There are efforts being made to like follow the natural history of these sorts of kids. And, um, and I'm sure the Epilepsy Foundation's kind of, you know, hopefully pointing you in the direction of those kind of natural history studies. And so we can be a bit more systematic about following these sorts of, because as you say, a lot of the people who were described originally are children. And so we don't have long-term data, um, but then how do we report that back easily to families is, is a bigger question that I don't have an answer for easily. I'm really sorry. If yeah, I had to answer for you, I would tell you. <laughs> no, that's good. And thank you to the person that just said about setting Google alerts. That's yes. a good idea as well. <laughs> yeah. Google alerts are great. 
I mean, I, I, I do try like just in my own like professional practice to kind of keep a list and once a year, like do a bit of a recall on papers, but I mean, like the task is overwhelming and not everybody has time. Yep. Hi, Beck. Um, Hi. I am curious to know, um, do you find that broadly speaking, more people are being referred for genetic testing now? Do you think there's a bit of a swing that neurologists are sort of realising that there's a lot more um, diagnoses are through genetics? Yep. So I think um, there is like, you know, I don't want to say a genetic revolution, but I think for a long time there probably wasn't um, the utility of a, of a genetic diagnosis. And so, and also we weren't really able to find anything when we did a genetic test. And so for a long time there wasn't you know, many, many people probably didn't feel there was a huge value in sending people off to genetics unless um, you had a, you know, potentially it was a really, really clear cut thing that we knew we could diagnose. Um, whereas now it's, uh, there is a lot more testing we can do and it's a lot more readily available. And in fact, you know, lots of other subspecialists do the test without sending them to people to genetics. Um, and so then we just come in with the result, which is fine. And I suspect that's probably the way things will evolve over time, that we'll only be around with the result. We won't see you beforehand. Um, and so I think, but I think it's very popular now to try and find out why. And I, so I think your question is a valid one, that knowing why actually in the long run will help in terms of targeting treatment. Probably, we're probably in the, in, in the intermediate at the moment in that, um, it probably won't change anything at the moment, but the long-term goal is precision medicine where we can say, oh, your genetic cause is a change in ABC gene and your treatment is XYZ drug. And so that is the long-term goal. We're not quite there yet, but I think we're heading in that direction. And the mystical number people say is five to 10 years. Um, I think they say that because it feels close enough that it's not too far away, but it's far enough away that it's not too close. Um, so I don't know that it's really five to 10 years away, but, um, but I think that's, um, I think it will be not that far Yeah, Probably within my professional practice time, but I have a big mortgage, so I'll be around for a while. Yeah. We struggled that, um, uh, like our daughter was never really, given, like she was only given a very basic genetic test and then ended up having unnecessary brain surgery. And then since then has got a CDKL5 diagnosis that really should have been found before, but she's had a hemispherectomy now. So there's half her brain gone because I didn't do a test. So it's a bit frustrating, but we can't do anything about it now, but we just kind of want to make sure that more people are being tested, I guess. I, th I think it's, I think the, there's a big push, not just from neurology, from every subspecialty. We are like certainly in my hospital, my team is at capacity. We like we have grown and we are at capacity because every single subspecialist wants a piece of us. It is the new flavor of the month during genetic testing on everyone. Yeah. So I think in the next 20 years, everybody will have had a genetic test. Yeah. Which I think is like at the moment, that seems like a really scary prospect, but I think it'll be quite normal. Yeah. There's a, a few um, hurdles to overcome before that, like in terms of insurance and what that all means. And yeah, but certainly heading that way. Does anyone else have any questions for Beck? Um, so Beck, thanks for the presentation. I just, if I was deciding to get genetic testing, for example, what, how long would that process be? Like, obviously there's only 400 of you, like, <laughs> Yep, great question. So um, depending on where you live, uh, the, the wait times to see a genetic service vary across the country, somewhere between a six and a two, six, six month and a two year wait to see okay. a genetic service. Um, so the inequity is real. I, I apologize on behalf of genetic services across the country. Um, once you get in to see somebody, um, you can on the same day as you are being seen, like have your blood drawn and have the test. Um, but then the result takes anywhere between three and six months. Okay, cool. Thank you. So I apologize that it takes a long time to see us. Okay. It's okay. At least I know how, like, yeah. 
cool thank you and if you if you yourself are like as an adult want a referral your gp can make the referral or your subs but the best referral way pathway is through your subspecialist so if you haven't if you have a neurologist that is a little bit easier just in terms of the information gathering um but your gp can absolutely i mean you can refer yourself but as a general rule we don't really like that so um yeah usually a medical yeah. practitioner is preferred okay and cool if you're coming through the public system the cost that there should be no cost to you the appointment is free the test is free okay that's good to know thank you Great. Um, if there's no more questions, um, I will stop and thank um, Beck so much. Um, I, I actually learned quite a lot, I have to say. I, you know, I just presented in a way that was really digestible. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure that you're getting some thank yous there in the chat. Um, I guess just to everyone, please be... Um, Upfront, if there's any um, topics that you would like us to present through the Epilepsy Foundation, um, yeah, and we can follow those up. We've got one about seizure tracking that's coming up. And then also I'm hoping to get a presentation around um, an impact study that we've done on DEs. They're just starting to pull together results of a survey that many of us um, completed probably about 18 months ago now. Um, but some of the results from that are really quite astounding, um, the impact of, I guess, raising a child um, with a DE. So that will be really interesting. Um, yeah, so I just want to thank you all. I uh, appreciate you get, making some time and also to Becca uh, giving up her evening for us. Um, we really do appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye.